the Somerton man, identified as Carl Charles Webb. There are so many pieces to this story that it turned out not only to be probably the most famous case in Australia, but one of the most famous cases in the whole world. It's captivated those of us in the U.S. and other countries for a long time, since 1948. However, more and more has come out about Carl. I think it's important for me to explain also that while the professor announced that he'd gotten DNA off of the death mask and figured out who, in fact, the Somerton man was, the police seem reluctant to immediately agree that he was correct. It shows in many places that it's pending identification. That may change by the time this video comes out, but at this point, it's not absolutely concrete. I'll be interested to see how they go ahead to agree that they've got the right identification. In the case of John Clinton Doe, they exhumed a parent, so it's possible they may try to look for a direct relative of his to prove concretely that he was, in fact, Carl Webb. So first, right now, I'll play out the details of the original case, and then I'll explain what we know so far. The Somerton man died alone on Somerton Park Beach in Adelaide, South Australia, in 1948. But who he was has always remained a mystery. Even though it's been more than 70 years, people haven't stopped trying to solve this case. He was found looking dapper in a brown suit with a half-smoked cigarette resting on his collar. When he was last exhumed in hopes of identifying him, the police made the statement, it's important for everybody to remember the Somerton man is not just a curiosity or a mystery to be solved. It might be somebody's father, son, perhaps grandfather, uncle, or brother. And that's why we're doing this, to try to identify him. Police are hoping that DNA will solve this in the end. Somerton man was found on his back in the sand, shoulders propped up against the seawall. That he was dressed so well in a suit and newly polished shoes was just more of a mystery. Two apprentice jockeys were in the area and they saw him lying there the night before. But when they went to investigate, they said his arm moved, so they moved on thinking he was fine. It was odd in part two, because if he chose to go somewhere to die, it was a weird place to do it. It was pretty public and had people often milling around the area. The examination of his remains raised more questions than it answered. All of the labels on his clothing had been removed and he wasn't carrying any ID. They couldn't identify the cause of death, but it was considered to be unnatural. There's a theory he consumed some sort of rare poison that was able to disappear without a trace, leading to heart failure. He's described as being a well-built man, 40 to 50, 5 foot 11, with gray blue eyes and brown hair that had begun to gray at the sides. Even his toenails were well-groomed. He was clearly not a homeless man, and for this reason, police believe someone would miss him and he'd be identified, but that just didn't happen. One weird aspect they found, however, is that his feet were pointed as if he had been in the habit of wearing high-heeled, pointed shoes. His calves were muscled also in a way that supports that theory. There were also suggestions that he could be a dancer. Others insisted he was a sailor or a spy. Some believed him to possibly be British. His clothes appeared to have come from America, so it's possible he was well-traveled. Many people over the years have called in tips, but all have led to dead ends. He had purchased a train ticket to Henley Beach, near Somerton Beach, but he didn't use it for some reason. Instead, he made his way to the beach by bus. They know his suitcase was found at the train station, and it contains some distinctive orange thread that had been used to repair the suit panels he was wearing so they're positive it's his case. Nothing in the bag pointed to his name. One strange clue was in a hidden pocket inside of his suit, and inside was a rolled up paper with the words, to mom shoot, which means the end or finished in Persian. It had been ripped from a book and it was about a poem, about how we are on the earth to enjoy it. And when we are done, it's time to pass on with no regrets. The book it came from was discarded in a random car and was turned in by the man who found it. The book was seen as the best clue, and inside it was a phone number for a woman who lived nearby. When the police found her and questioned her, they described her as acting suspiciously. She reacted to the photo of the Somerton man 
but she claimed not to know him. The police, for years, attempted to question her, but she always refused. Eventually, an armchair detective uncovered her name, but by then, Jessica Ellen Thompson had passed away in 2007, never disclosing the identity of the man or how she knew him. His post-mortem photos can be found online if searched. We don't show those on this channel, but I always tell you if they're there. It does appear they are trying to use DNA to find out who he was. He was exhumed on May 19, 2021. The Severton man was likely born in the late 1800s and has gone unidentified for 73 years. Slowly, more and more details have come out, more than I actually suspected was even possible. And you'll see why it's likely the professor was correct. Many specific aspects have been explained. Carl Webb sometimes went by the name of Charles. But in this case, I'm just going to refer to him as Carl, since it's his given name. In this case, it's pretty original because Carl passed away 70 years ago. So all that knew him are long gone too. Most of what's coming out now comes from the careful work of a man named Derek Abbott. He's a researcher at a college, and he tried for many, many years to identify the Somerton man. The weird thing about it, too, is he somehow was given access to the death mask, which is the plaster mask that they used to rebuild what he looked like in the recreations. Reportedly, the authorities in Australia were using genetic genealogy to find his name. But then there was a large gap in time and nothing was announced. It appears their quest didn't end with his name. But instead, it was this researcher from Adelaide University who came into contact with the death mask, and he used that to build his own recreation. And with that access to the death mask came the details that people on multiple continents have been waiting to know. Who exactly was the Somerton man? We all came to care about the strange man who took his own life included the coded note in his pocket and the strange book of Persian poems, and he was smartly dressed in a double-breasted suit. In addition, he had an unused ticket to Henley Beach, so why? Why did he do this? The phone number he had led to Jessica Allen Thompson. That's also fascinating, especially since she refused to say if she knew him. It was very odd that she just flat-out refused to help or answer questions. As a result, his story remained absolutely compelling. For many years, people were convinced he was a Cold War era spy. But it turns out he wasn't. Carl was the youngest of six kids born to a family in 1905 in Australia. Although his family itself had immigrated a few years before from Hamburg, Germany, his father married a woman named Eliza in 1892 and they opened a bakery in Springvale, Victoria. They were a loving family, and Carl, as well as his three brothers and two sisters, grew up appreciating hard work, but also with a lot of love. His sister Doris is seen here. His brother Roy, pictured here, passed away five years before Carl took his life on Somerton Beach. His brother Roy was killed in action during World War II in 1943. Authorities knew that the fancy suit Carl was wearing had been purchased in the U.S., and this fact would further contribute to the allure of a bigger story. It turned out that the clothing likely belonged to his brother-in-law. Charles had a sister named Frida, who was married to Thomas Gerald Keene. This explains why the name Keene was on some of his possessions. Frida and Thomas had a son, who was also serving at World War II. He, too, died in battle in 1943 as did their brother Roy. John Keene had apparently resided in the U.S. at one time, and in his possession were things like U.S. maps, coins, and clothing. It's believed that it's likely the suit that Carl took his life in that belonged to John. In fact, with Carl's possessions, the authorities noted a laundry bag with the last name of Keene, as did a singlet, which those of us in the U.S. might not recognize as a shirt with no sleeves. Carl also had with him a tie that said T. Keen. A link to the complete list of possessions found with the Somerton man can be found in the description below. While there aren't any photographs further proving Carl was a Somerton man, it's noted how similar he looks to his brother Roy, especially in the photo with the side view. 
After his brother's death and as time went on, Carl began to suffer from depression. A lot of terrible things had happened pretty close together. In 1939, Carl lost his father. Then, in 1943, both his brother and his nephew were killed in war. Then, in 1941, his mother passed away. Later that same year, Carl married for the first time to a woman named Dorothy, and she is identified as working as a foot specialist. It was a lot to go through for Carl, and he was obviously an intelligent guy. At the time of his death, he was 43 and he'd been working as an electrical engineer and an instrument maker, living in Footscray, which is located in Melbourne, Australia. It's hard to believe no one recognized his death photos, especially since there was a lot of publicity. But of course, he was 728 kilometers from home, which is about 450 miles. Letters from around that time indicate that Carl underwent a pretty severe personality change. According to letters written by his wife, Carl liked to play cards, but if he lost, he became sullen and angry. He began going to bed at 7 p.m. nightly. Sometimes when his wife Dorothy spoke to him, he would refuse to reply at all. She would go on to say that he liked to live a quiet life. He enjoyed both writing and reading poetry. He also enjoyed going and betting on horse races. So while we know now he wasn't some mysterious Cold War spy, there's still no known explanation for the phone number found with him. When the police went to question her, she had some strange reactions to his photo, and it was this that convinced them that she did know Carl, although she claimed not to know him. Whether they'd been having a relationship and the fact that he was married had something to do with her not saying it could be, but there's no way to know. Too many years have passed. We know her name was Jessica Ellen Thompson, but she died before the researcher found her name. It was something that had been kept under wraps until then. It's sad to think that one person might have been able to identify him while he still had a wife and siblings left behind. Three years after his death, Dorothy Webb filed for a divorce. In 1951, she placed an ad in the local Melbourne newspaper under a category named Missing Friends. This was legally required if she was going to be able to obtain a divorce. And in fact, it appears that his family just believed Carl was missing. They didn't believe that he had taken his life. Dorothy's petition for divorce was finalized in 1952 on the grounds that he had abandoned her. And I guess, in a way, he had. The years wound on, and no one knew what happened to Carl. At least not for 73 years. Carl Webb went unidentified for 73 years. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Take care of yourselves and each other.